Lord, we're so grateful that in the later years of his life, you gave the apostle John the book of Revelation. You spoke to him and now speak to us this morning through this book because it truly tells us the truth. Jesus, you have claimed the victory. It's over. You won and we win. Prepare our hearts to hear this message this morning that you've given us through your holy word. Prepare us to have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts to take it in and make it part of who we are as we go forward. And we pray all this. And thank you for this. In the precious name of the one who gave everything, who took our judgment on himself, Jesus. Amen. So many years ago, I lived in Pleasanton, and I was down here fishing in Monterey Bay with my fishing guru, my fishing mentor, Chef Paul, head of uh, a culinary institute. He was a neighbor. I got into fishing through him, and here we are fishing on Monterey Bay for salmon. A unique thing about fishing for salmon is you have to use a barbless hook. Within the hook where there's normally a barb, not with salmon. They're a different kind of fish. So you have to have specific gear for them. So we're fishing. We've already done well. We got a nice fat salmon in the cooler. We got another one on the line. Real, real, real. And this boat approaches us. And it's fish and game. We're not worried because we do everything by the book. That's truly how we rolled. So they come up and say, hey, boys, you got a fish on there we see? Yeah, can we watch you bring it in? Absolutely. Because if it's too short, we'll release it. We always did. You have any more? Yeah, we got one in the icebox. Well, can we take a look at that one? Uh, we said, sure. Check the boat. Do anything you want because we're legal. And so we used a rod here, and the rod my friend was reeling. And we had a rod and a rod rack that we hadn't used all day. We never touched it. So they checked the rods for those barbless hooks. And they go over to the one we hadn't used, and Paul says, we didn't use that one. But it had a hook on it with a lure, and those hooks came with a barb. So you'd always put the lure in a vise, and you'd file the barb down, which my friend Paul did, we thought. So the fishing game guy is going like this inside the hook. You know, I can kind of feel a bit of a snag there. And Paul's going, well, come on. I mean, it's not going to snag a fish. He goes, I'm sorry, man. I'm gonna, i got to write you up for that illegal hook for salmon. Paul's going, you're kidding me. All right, I'm going to see you in court. And the guy says, indeed, we'll see you in court. Paul asked me, Den, will you testify on my behalf? And I said, of course, I'll testify on your behalf. We're in court. He's in his full chef's outfit because he has to run to work afterwards. He testifies. He, he um, interrogates me, questions me on the stand. I give my testimony. Fish and game guy gives his. And we made a great case, and we thought it was all good. And the judge went, <laughs> guilty. My buddy had to pay a huge fine. And we were like, that's outrageous. That's mean. It's unfair. Now, flash forward to so many years ago, I was abalone diving, uh, as I would do every year, up on the Sonoma coast. I arranged to meet my friend, Pastor John, from a church in Livermore and his dive buddies at a place I hadn't dived before. It's called Salt Creek or Salt River, Salt something. Salt. And I used to... <laughs> I used to dive at a place near it, and I said, well, I, I'm glad to meet you there. Salt Point. I'm glad to meet you there. So I get there early, of course. I've never been there. I want to check it all out. The wind is howling in the morning, and the spray is going. It's 8 o'clock when they were due, 8.15, 8.30. They don't come. They don't show. Almost 9 o'clock, I said, well, I don't know what to do. There's no cell phone service anywhere. I can't call them. I don't know what happened. I found out later they had an accident and couldn't come. But there I am, and I see this. Now, I'm facing the ocean here. I see a little cove to my left. It's about 200 yards across. I go, that's perfect. It's kind of protected. I can go in there. So I go in there, and I'm diving down. you got a breath hold. Hold your breath. And I get three abalone. They're all eight inches, the minimum seven. We never get sevens, always eight or bigger, just to be sure. So I pop up out of the water. I put them in my floating abalone tube, and I make my way over to the side where the rocks are, where I climb down, ready to climb back up. And there's a guy sitting up there, and he goes, hey, did you get any? I said, I sure did. <laughs> How many did you get? Three. That's the legal limit. I'm Mr. Legal. And I go up to the top, and he goes, oh, yeah, they, they look nice. He's fishing game. He said, 
you dove in an illegal preserve. I said, why? What do you mean illegal preserve? How would I? There's no, he goes, see across there, across the cove to the other side, on the rocks is a yellow sign. I'm looking, the wind's howling, they're spread. I don't, the waves are in froth, and I don't see it. He goes, well, it's there. And I look, and I go, well, maybe that one spot. He goes, that's it. And that, meets, that makes a line over this sign above on the cliff, and there's a sign like this about this size, and it's faded. You can't read it. It's sun faded. The, the wind is blowing, and you have to get right here to read it, and it says from here to there is a line. You can't dive inside of that. Fortunately, I did not injure the abalone. I say that because abalone are hemophiliac. You nick one, they bleed out. I didn't. Sometimes, just for fun, we wouldn't even use the ab arm. we just pop them off. So he goes, well, you're lucky. We can put those back, but I'm sorry. i got to write you up. And now other people had arrived at the parking lot, and here I am, the poaching pastor, <laughs> which my friends at the Monterey Sports Center reminded me of for the next two years. Oh, it's the pilfering pastor. So I go to court, right? And I have to drive all the way back up to Sonoma Courthouse, and I'm in court with armed robbers, you know, assault and battery people, drug busts, all of that. Uh, what are you here for, sir? I took some abalone. Everybody's kind of go, you know. But I tell the story, and I say, Your Honor, you know, it's the signs, and, you know, you couldn't tell, and my friends are supposed to be there to guide me, and she's listening going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Guilty. Right after that, I got a notice from the Board of Behavioral Sciences, which governs my private therapy license, the marriage family therapy license. Said, yeah, we were uh, informed that you were uh, uh, busted for poaching uh, abalone. You need to write a letter and explain this, or your license is going to be suspended. Everything's connected these days. So I was judged in both circumstances. The first one my friend had to pay, but I was part of it. The second one I did. And I remember thinking about both of those instances like it's no fair, you're being mean, you know, you don't prosecute everything else you, you see. Why don't you go after the bank robbers? You know, all the dumb stuff we say when we're busted. And I thought, you know, at some point I thought, I got to make a decision here. Either I'm going to stay bitter and mad at fish and game and mad at the world, or I'm going to learn something. I decided to learn. So in truth, the hook had a little thing in it. My friend should have filed it down more. That's the truth. In truth... I can't blame signs for diving in a preserve because it's my job to know where the preserve is. I've incorporated those thoughts and those lessons into my life of harvesting the sea since then, and I'm pretty much a stickler for following the law. So I see it, you know, it was a good thing. I learned from it. We're talking about judgment today. We find this in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 20. Judgment. It's a tough topic and in judgment, we have to talk about the end. And you know how the end is. Like, if there's a movie out, and you really want to see the movie, but you come around somebody, and they go, oh, we already saw it, so here's what happened. In the opening scene, you go, no, 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 I don't want to know. Don't tell me the end. And they keep going, you go, la, 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 I don't want to know. But I got to tell you, with Revelation, I think you do want to know. In fact, we very much want to know the end. And we can find it there. We need to know, are the good guys going to win? Because in reality, the events of human existence are going to end. I don't know when. The time will be up. Everything will be revealed. And I don't know about you, but that freaks me out sometimes. It kind of freaks me out. And then I kind of gather myself. It's a little bit like a movie we own. We own a movie called um, Book of Eli with Denzel Washington. It's about the end. It's about when everybody's wiped out. Now, it's not the biblical end, but it's a kind of an end. It's an apocalyptic event. There's a number of apop apocalyptic movies out. And why are they written? Well, they're written because they're interesting, they're creative. We all kind of wonder, uh, is it all going to end at some point? But they write them to make money, pure as can be. They write them to make money, you know, sort of capturing our interest in the end. So they're not real. There's zombies all over. I mean, all this stuff. Big creatures that are mutated and all that. But it's not real. But God is the real deal. Judgment is coming. I mean, we can't read Revelation and leave that out. It would be dishonest. Judgment is coming. It's tough to hear. It's tough to hear. And 
for many, when they think about judgment, it's really hard to hear. I don't want any judgment coming on me. I got some things going on that uh, I wish were different. And in today's Western culture, it's really popular to highlight never judging anyone ever. Don't judge. Don't be a judge. You're judging. You commented, you're judging. And so we're not supposed to have any view at all on anyone's behavior, their words, um, their claims, their assertions, or anything at all. We're not supposed to. If you do it, you're just bad. You're wrong. Don't judge. And in that climate, it could be difficult to see, well, then, then isn't God's judgment bad too? How do, I, how do I not judge but view a God who does judge? And we're going to unpack that today because Revelation tells us how that works. And chapter 6 begins describing the events that will occur in tribulation when we draw near the end. It's all there, chapter 6 through 20. And it's the tribulation that will come upon the people who've rebelled against God and rejected him. It's true, it's all there. So what is it about judgment that puts us off? Why is it so tough? I think of it this way. I've suffered in my life. I have to say right now, I'm not suffering particularly from any one thing, but I have off and on over the years. I will again. Uh, I've had tragedy in my life. There'll be more, not because of anything unique and peculiar or specific, because I'm alive. I'm on the planet. It's the same with you. I'll wager everyone in this room has had some kind of suffering happen in their life. Maybe you're in it right now. Maybe you see that some is coming. So we don't like suffering. And the idea that there's a tribulation where suffering happens is really an ugly thought for us. So I, I looked about, I looked online about what is judgment? Why is it so hard for us? What is it, what is it about the word that puts us off? And the number 43 came to mind. I went online and I put in judgment. I stopped reading, scanning after 43 websites that said how bad judgment is. Don't ever do it. You should never do it. You're mean and wrong if you do it. I kind of agree, but let's look at the reality of it. Here's the reality of it. Who really doesn't judge? I believe, paradoxically, that we judge all the time. I really do. I believe that we judge personal preference, appearance, fitness, wealth, social standing, education level, pedigree, ancestry, character. We, we judge governments. We judge churches. Churches judge other churches. Businesses, neighbors, and on and on. We do that. And the odd irony in that is here I am, someone who's broken and flawed and a sinner, and it's just true, and I have my survey machine of a broken, flawed guy surveying other people. Well, what am I going to find? I got a broken machine surveying other people's broken machines. That's why it's so hard. And so, if being judgmental is so uncool, how can God's judgment be good and right? If it's so uncool, how can his judgment be good and right? So we know that we're imperfect. We know that we judge others imperfectly. But if we see ourselves as we truly are, you do that painful inner search you know, you allow yourself to look at your weaknesses and your flaws, and you understand that. And then you read history, and you think of the people in your life that you know, and you understand that about them. We admit it's true. We're troubled and broken. On the other side, God is not troubled, not broken, not flawed, and is without sin. So we need to see this picture. We have to get this picture, the vision that we're seeing here. And as Pastor Kevin has shared beautifully in the weeks prior to this morning, Revelation has so many fascinating and mysterious images, and we're not unpacking the images. And he's beautifully laid out why we don't do that, because we want to get to the essence of the meaning for all of us underneath all of that imagery. But it's true about Revelation 6 through 20, the, the chapters we're covering this morning. Here's a sample of the things you can find in there. When you look, you'll find seven seals, a golden censer, seven trumpets, an angel, and a little scroll, horses and riders, two witnesses, a woman and a dragon, the beast out of the sea, 
the lamb and the 144,000. Three angels, seven plagues, seven bowls of God's wrath, Babylon and the beast, and on. But in Revelations 20, this is where we learn that we are faced with judgment. It will happen to us all, no matter whether you welcome it or not. It's a little bit like saying, I don't believe the sun came up today. You can believe that. It doesn't have anything to do with the reality that the sun came up today. So no matter whether you welcome it or not, believe it or not, or turn away and deny it, we find this in these verses in chapter 20. Then I saw a great white presence, a great white throne, excuse me, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, was thrown in the lake of fire. All evil, all wickedness, all of it will die a final time and never be present again. The victory is already won. That's what scripture tells us. And sometimes we get so caught up in the heated debates about end times prophecies, the mark of the beast and the antichrist, that we forget the main point of the book of Revelation. We need to that we need to get the picture and the purpose of these passages in Revelation. So beginning with verse 1 in chapter 6, the imagery and symbolism start to come at us so intensely that we can be overwhelmed. We can just begin to feel like, I can't do this. I can't dig into this. I don't want those images in my head. I understand that. Years ago, I would read it and get frightened. It's like, this stuff's really creeping me out. And many stop reading because they're afraid to keep reading. And the word tribulation brings up terrifically difficult and troubling images. But we have to know this. The intent of Revelation chapter 6 through 20 is not to intimidate us or to frighten us into compliance. Indeed, a wise man said this. He said, if after reading Revelation 6, 20, we find ourselves afraid, we have not read it correctly. And it's true. The events of human existence will come to an end. The time will be up. Everything will be revealed. It's all true. And it can still kind of freak me out. It really can. Why? Because we're already, we've already suffered. We know what that's about. We already know how it feels. We don't want any more. We'll be tested. But our faith will save us. But we have to hear that correctly. It isn't my faith that saves me, it's the one in whom I have faith that saves me. I am not able to be good and righteous enough to be in the presence of my Lord forever on my own. But I am if I receive Jesus who went to the cross for judgment for my sin. Then I am. Then it works. We read about this in Revelation chapter 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down and they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That's a curious statement in the scripture, and I struggled with it, and then something became clear for me. I'm going to present it to you and see if it helps you. How do we not love our lives so much so as not to shrink from death? Well, if you picture in the last, in the upper room for the Last Supper, Jesus is reclining, and his followers are eating with him, and there's 12 of them. One leaves, that makes 11, and we know that One eventually lives a much longer period of time. It's John who wrote Revelation. So that leaves 10. 
What happened to them? Well, history tells us that each one of them died a martyr's death. They died a horribly painful death for one reason only, even though other explanations were attached to it, because they would not give up on Jesus. They would not reject Jesus. Many were offered an opportunity. Many were told, give up the name of Jesus, and uh, worship the emperor, and you can have your life. And so they said, I don't lo love my life so much as to shrink from death. I will not shrink from death. You can kill me, but I'm not giving up Jesus. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's what this means. And then we need to get the message. What's the message? We need to understand God's truth. Revelation gives a purpose and a plan to the suffering that we face. Just as he, Jesus, will ultimately conquer sin and death, we too can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. As John once said, there he goes, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, whose blood was shed on the cross. We are covered by the blood of the Lamb when we receive Jesus. And it reminds us that he will soon come again and all things will be restored. What does restored mean? You, you, can, you can look at the word shalom. I've been in Israel a couple of times and shalom is a, is a common greeting there. But you know what else shalom means? It means that point in God's history when all things will finally be made perfect in their right relationship with each other. That's ultimate shalom. That is coming. So making us feel afraid is not John or Jesus' intention. Jesus does not give John, the churches of Asia Minor, and us as apocalypse to frighten us. He gives us apocalypse to help us keep our balance. He gives us his apocalypse to fuel hope. I found a quote on a website called The Good Seed. They occasionally have some really, really wise sayings that speak to me, and this one did. If we fail to see God's purpose for judgment, we will view it negatively, and we'll think of it as punishment instead of grace and mercy. However, if we understand God's purpose for judgment, and we will see why it is needed, and recognize that it is a wonderful work of grace and that many blessings flow from it to fuel hope. You see, the whole reason Jesus came to earth was to glorify God by taking on himself the judgment we deserve, that I deserve. He took it on himself. It's the strangest thing, but the one thing that matters most in all of life, we can't earn or purchase. All we do is soften our heart and receive it. It's this gift of taking my judgment on himself. So he took on himself the judgment we deserve, and he thus paid for our sins by the sacrifice of his own life. So what do we do with this? If this is all true, and I know it is, if Jesus is who he says he is, and he is, what do I do with this? I've heard all this. What do I do with it? We move on it. We take action. We have to take action in our life in the church to make it real. There are some verses in the New Testament that can guide us. I'm going to present them to you, and then we're going to give you four steps that I want to encourage us all to do as one body. It says in John, the book written by the same person who wrote Revelation, it says, take heart. These are the words of Jesus. I have overcome the world. Take heart. I have overcome the world. And Paul says in the book of 2 Timothy, in his encouraging work to Timothy, who's going to be the one who receives the baton of leadership as Paul ultimately is executed, this young leader, he says this, indeed, this is a strange encouragement, you might think. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. I emphasize it like that because many times there's a trap Christians fall into, and I've fallen into it. 
I don't understand why all this is happening because I'm a Christian. I follow the Bible. I tithe. I do all the right things. Why is this happening? Well, it's happening because it says right here, you will be persecuted. Why? Because you're following the one who gave it all, who suffered for us. I'm going to suffer. So that we, we dare not see it as it shouldn't happen. It's an anomaly. It's strange. But we get to see it correctly in light of Scripture that if you follow Jesus, indeed, in addition to the sufferings of just being on the planet, you're likely to have more for following him. And we read in Luke, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour where you do not expect him. We need to heed the call of the church. Heed this call in the book of Revelation. So that last one, we don't, <laughs> the Son of Man, I, I love this. He will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Most things in our life have due dates. Just yesterday, the day before, we threw out a bag of uh, breakfast bars that were up in January. We didn't eat them, but we looked at, <laughs> if we hadn't looked at the date, I'd have thrown those down out on the boat. Probably would have been a disaster. You know how due dates work? So we have this due date. When I was in college, it was, you know, delay, 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 delay. Ah, the report's due Friday. Now I got to cram, cram, cram. What would we do if we actually had a due date for the return of Jesus? I say that because many have claimed a due date. Many have claimed dates. If any of them were accurate, we wouldn't be sitting here today. The reality is even Jesus didn't know. So there's no due, due date. So what are we going to do? What will we do? I want to encourage you to join me in three steps we can take every day to make this action, to move on this. Number one, we will take heart. We will take heart. I will encourage you. Will you encourage me? Will we come alongside of each other? Will we build one another up? Will we pour goodness and support into you and your struggles? Will we take heart? Will we rest on the truth and the hope and we have in Jesus? Will we do that? Remind each other about that. Will we take heart? Number two, we will heed the call. I have two calls in my life. First one, I was 18, done with high school. I was just an idiot in high school. Football, playing, fist fight, and drunken idiot. I'm just telling you. No Christians in my family. I run into two buddies, Glenn and Roger, that I played football with, who'd been idiots along with me. And I ran into them in town. And they said, hey, D. I used to call me D Money back in the day. You may not call me that. You can call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for lunch. But anyway. So I ran into them. They say, hey, what are you doing this week? And I said, nothing. Well, we're going to go do something really cool. You want to go with us? I said, sure. Because I like these guys. They were guys I really admired as uh, football players and people. So I got in a car on a Friday night and went with them. Where are we going? Oh, you'll see. So we get out in Costa Mesa at this building. I can hear the worship music or whatever it was. I didn't know about worship music. Never been to a church in my life. And I finally go in, and I said, oh, I'm going, oh, man, if they had, I knew if they had told me about this, I'd have never gotten in that car. I thought we were going to something really cool. <laughs> this guy preaches a sermon, something changed. The place is explosive with joy and praise. And he made a call. He said, if you don't know Jesus, you want to know Jesus, you can receive him right now. And I felt like a, track, a, a crane picked me up and just marched me up and plopped me on the stage. Changed my life. I gave my life to Jesus that day. So what about the second call? For me, the second call was this. Well, I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Now what? Well, if you're saved, the Lord has things for you, and he has things he wants from you. That's the call. Our job is to pay attention and listen and hear and do what he asks us to do. So we'll take heart, we'll heed the call, and we'll hold fast. I was out on the ocean yesterday with my bride and her mom, Susan, and we were going to do a little fishing. I got a Boston whaler. It's got a lot of rails on it, which is a good thing. And the ocean was not happy. And we were not happy on the ocean, except we loved being together and seeing otters and all that. But we tried fishing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so I said right away, remember, when you move on the boat, grab a rail. Grab a rail. They're super strong rails. 
That's why they have rails on this boat. When the ocean's coming at you, we had a south swell two foot, we had a northwest swell five foot, and we had an offshore breeze 13 knots. That's soup. It's a washing machine, fair enough. We're holding on to the rails and being really careful. Will you hold fast? Sometimes the ocean conditions are just things going on in your life, things going on in culture, things going on at work, things going on at school if you're at school. And they tend to rock you and want to move you and pull you away and draw you away and distract you. Will you hold fast? If it's, just think of a rail. Hold fast. And last, be ready. Again, there's no due date. The Bible's clear. Jesus doesn't know when it's all ending. He was clear about that. I don't know. We got to live each day like, man, it's probably today. That's not a buzz kill. It's not like, oh, it's probably today. It's a beautiful thing. He's going to come and make everything right. And everything right is beautiful and perfect. So we got to make sure we live each day this way and not put it off. Well, maybe next week I'll get a hold of all this. We got to do it today. So both in the church and in our individual lives, we must constantly fight against the temptation to become loveless, immoral, lenient, compromising, lifeless, or casual about our faith. I have a quote here from the comments in the Life Application Study Bible that I really like. It spoke to me. Revelation reassures us that good will triumph over evil. It gives us hope as we face difficult times and gives guidance when we are wavering in our faith. Heather and I had a great talk yesterday afternoon about waver. What does it mean? I say that because I'm one of your pastors and I have wavered and at times it happens. But let me tell you what it's not first. I never abandon Jesus, never reject Jesus, never reject, reject the Bible as God's word and holy truth. But sometimes I feel dry. Sometimes I'm just not as filled up. Sometimes I'm curious and I doubt and I wonder and I just cry out to the Lord. It's reality. If that's you to here today, I'm really glad you're here. But I want you to know it happens to all of us, and, and so we hold fast, and we stand firm, and we stay ready so that even if it happens, even if we, we feel that happening, we come back to the truth, and we hold on, and we're once again invigorated and led forward, but if you're here today, and it's been a long time for you, I hope you'll come up and tell us and let us pray for you, because people have prayed for me. I hope we can pray for you. If you're here today, and you're not even sure about Jesus or this whole Christianity thing. We're really glad you're here. Hallelujah. Just great to have you here. But maybe today is that day. And you say, you know, I, I want to know. I want him. I need something to hold on to when this world is knocking me around or my own choices, my own life is knocking me around. Maybe today's that day. Would you come up if it's you and let us pray for you? The book of life, as I mentioned earlier, has, has it all. The names of those who put their trust in Christ to save them and the deeds of everyone, and not the deeds save you. But the outcome of a changed heart, the outcome of, of a heart that has received grace, the unconditional favor of God, the eternity with Jesus, the outcome of that is I want to do what you asked me to do for you, Jesus. And I want to make sure others who don't know you have an opportunity to receive what I've received. We have the gracious gift of salvation through Jesus, the new covenant of grace. It's freely given, freely received. But this beautiful gift does not free us from the requirement of obeying God faithfully and doing what he calls us to do with our lives in service. So we need to live each day following Jesus the best we can, knowing that someday the books will be open, and that's a beautiful thing. Our challenge is to allow the truths and events of the book of Revelation guide us, reassure us, and encourage us to follow Jesus all the more, day in and day out. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the understanding of the book of Revelation. This beautiful thing you gave to John so that 
he would give it to us. Help us understand it's all part of fueling hope in our life today to know that you have the end in hand so we can hang on to that at times when we're not sure what's happening or why it's happening or where it's going, but we can hang on to that knowing that you have it in hand and that you love those that you've created in your image and you adopt those who turn their face to you and receive Jesus. Thank you for the beauty of that reassurance that you've given us through Revelation 6 through 20. We look forward, Father, to each day to follow you all the more, Jesus. And we pray this in the precious name of the one who gave it all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's great having you here today. And I want to want to remind you again, we have people that will be praying up front, and I'll be up here. And we do this because prayer means everything to us. Some people have told me, well, I, I didn't want to come up because I don't want to take your time. You can't imagine the joy it gives me to be able to pray with people and just for a moment share their lives. Please don't hesitate. For anything, come forward for prayer. Now, if you're new today, you can text welcome to the number on the screen, and you'll receive all kinds of welcome and guidance for what to do next if you're new. But also, if you're new in the worship center, and that's you online can call this, those of you watching online. And if you're here today and you're new, please go to the Connection Center. We have a gift for you. We have answers for questions. We can tell you what's going on here. And if you're new today, you don't feel like going there, you can go ahead and text online as well and get the information that way. So we're just so glad you're with us. Um, I want to tell you one, only one other announcement. Merry Christmas. <laughs> At 12.30 today, you are invited to help us decorate this church. If you want to come, we're all, the staff's going to be there, everybody. We're going to be singing songs and decorating this church. So I invite you to join us now. If you're able to stand, please stand. I'd love to give you a blessing as you head out today. May you walk out of here heeding the we will calls. May you hold fast when life outside of you and inside of you rocks you. May you be ready at all times for the return and look forward to it with eagerness and hope. May you go out and be a blessing for others. When the opportunities arise, let them know where this comes from and from whom you receive it. So God bless you. Have the greatest day ever. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.